We start with the second session of the plenary session on the standard model. I invite the first speaker, Andrea Akinov. He will talk about the top physics experimental overview. Uh, Andrea, I see you already sharing your screen. Please, it's all yours. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we do hear you. Okay, great, thank you. Yes, my name is Andrea. Thanks very much for the invitation. And I will talk today about top quarks physics from the experimental side, and we'll show you why the top quark is still going strong. I'll start by addressing a couple of comments that you've probably heard countless times. Things like the top quark is the heaviest quark, which is almost the mass of a gold atom. Actually, today it's uh, between tungsten and rhenium, roughly, but gold obviously sounds a bit uh, more fancy. It, that it plays a special role in the standard model. And I will show you today why it is special and that the NHC is a top quark factory. And I will show you also today that this really very much depends on the production process. So since when do we know that the top quark exists? So you can see here the particles that we knew in 1977 when the big quark was just found. And at this point, we were sure that there should be another quark. And this, uh, we thought that would be very easy to find. But due to its large mass, it took until 1995 until it was actually discovered. It has a lot, the largest coupling to the Higgs boson. As you know, particles have different couplings to the Higgs boson, and it depends on the mass. And in the case of the top quark, it's of the order of almost one. Then it can decay before any hadron formation or spin decorrelation can take place, which means that we can obtain its properties from its decay products. And it plays a prominent role in the standard model extensions. So why is the top quark so important? You will see today that top quarks are key to almost everything. So there are a lot of rare standard model processes that are accessible now that involve top quarks, like for example, the TT by Higgs process shown here. There is um, the opportunity to use it for b tag and calibration, for example, because we can uh, select top quarks in a very pure sample and then can make calibrations with it. And then it plays a fundamental role in the stability of the universe due to its large mass. And we also have it in a lot of Bian standard model extension where it plays a special role. And I will show also a few examples of this today. I first start with, uh, with the cross-section measurement itself. So the question is how uh, and how often does the LHC produce top quarks? I have here some representative numbers for one LHC experiment for the full 13 TV data set. And you can see processes like TT bar are really very ubiquitous. So we have 116 million events roughly there. But you can see also for other processes, this number is a lot smaller. And for example, for top quark production, uh, for, for top production, we only have about 1,700 events that we expect in this data set. We can produce the top quarks via strong and via electroweak interaction. And the different final states give us access to different properties of the top quark. And the question is, these rare processes that I just mentioned, can we actually measure them or is this still too difficult? And since we have a plethora of measurements, I can only focus on the latest ones today. I start with inclusive TT bar cross-section measurements that have been measured at 7, 8, and 13 TeV to very high precision. And the relative uncertainty, for example, for the most precise 13 TeV measurement is only 2.5%. But we also have a tiny 5 TeV data set taken in 2015. And we had one additional week of data taken in 2017 at 5 TeV. And the cross-section there is more than one magnitude smaller than at 13 TeV. But as you can see here in the right-hand plots, ATLAS and CMS have both measured this cross-section and the relative uncertainties are already below 8%. And they are strongly dominated by statistical uncertainties and in very good agreement with the um, theoretical predictions. Now, um, it's not only ATLAS and CMS who can produce top quarks, but obviously we can also uh, see them at other experiments. And one example is shown here for the LHDB experiment at 13 TV. Obviously, here this is a little bit more difficult since we don't have the um, full 4 pi coverage. But at 13 TB, the cross section um, at LHCB increased by a factor of 10 compared to 8 TB, where it was first discovered at LHCB. And this is done here now in the dilepton final stage, where we have a very clean signal. And the largest background process you come from left on misidentification. And what you see here in the left hand plot is the invariant mass distribution, and you see in purple the TT bar process. And as you can see, the, the um, backgrounds are quite small, but also the statistical uncertainties are still quite high. But the overall uncertainty here that was measured was of 20%, while the uncertainty on the theoretical calculation is of the order of 25 to 30%. 
Now we also want to measure the um, standard model in different parts of the phase space, since new physics might manifest itself only in some corners of the phase space. And we can use these differential cross-section measurements to use for um, Monte Carlo tuning. And so there are different kinds of measurements that I will present today. We can measure the kinematic distributions of the events, for example, event kinematics, top and TT bar system properties. And we can do this at resolved and in boosted topologies. Resolved in this case means the left-hand plot where the top quark decays, but all the decay products are spatially separated. And on the right-hand side, you see how it looks like when we have a boosted top quark, where all the decay products are so strongly collimated that we can reconstruct them as one large R jet. Now we want to perform an unfolding measurement, which means we remove detector effects. And this can be done in two ways, either at parton level, where we can compare it to fixed order calculations, or at particle level, which is more um, model independent. But also here we have a huge number of measurements. I can only show a subset, but more will be shown tomorrow in the talk from Anna. So here, just to remind you that we used to have a, dis a disagreement between data and Monte Carlo for the top PT already at 7 and 8 TV. And here's the first look at 13 TV with the full data set. On the left-hand side, the upper left-hand side, it's in the, uh, in the boosted all-hydronic channel. In the upper uh, middle, this is for the left and channel. And you see that for both cases, we still have a slope. So the, uh, the data still has a softer top PT. If we look at this in a more differential way, as shown here by the CMS measurement in the two bottom plots, you can see that in events with, um, uh, four, uh, with zero additional jets, so with exactly uh, four jets, for example, we still have the slope, while in events with two additional jets, we have perfect data Monte Carlo agreement. So there seems to be the disagreement to be largest for events without additional radiation. In addition, with the full data set, we were also able now to reduce the uncertainty significantly. For example, for the lepton plochette channel, we used an additional technique where we use the invariant mass of the large R jet to reduce the jet energy scale uncertainty, uh, which then allowed uh, overall to reduce the, the uncertainty. Here's a combined measurement of the result in the boosted channel, which is also brand new. Uh, where you can see here different distributions, again, for example, the top core PT, but also distributions sensitive to additional radiation, like the additional jets and uh, HT distributions. What we see here is that we have a disagreement at lower PT, uh, TT bar and MTT bar, and for variables sensitive to radiation, which is not too surprising given that we are always comparing with next to leading order plus pattern trial Monte Carlo generators. And we have strongly reduced systematic uncertainties due to a combination of several reconstruction techniques here. So the dominating uncertainties that remain are still from jet energy scale and TT bar modeling. Then here is an additional boosted differential TT bar cross section measurement for uh, also for variables which are sensitive to radiation. Also here you can see um, that we have some disagreement, but what we also uh, need to see here is, for example, that um, if we compare to a Monte Carlo generator setup, which has more initial state radiation, for example, in the upper left plot, if you look at the pink distribution, this agrees with data a lot better. So the ISR up predictions are often in better agreement than the nominal prediction. The fiducial particle level cross sections that were measured here are 20% smaller than the prediction, but this is still in agreement with the theoretical expectation. And no um, Monte Carlo generator seem to be describing all distributions perfectly, but we find consistent um, findings between Atlas and CMS. Now I would like to focus a bit more on the top quark coupling, since you know that the top quark selects every particle and couples to every particle. And I'll start with the electrode couplings here. Looking at the TTW production, we see here that we have a relative uncertainty of 22%, which are mostly dominated by statistical and signal modeling uncertainties. And the significance for this process is about 5.3 standard deviations observed by the CMS experiment. The TT plus Z process, we can measure more precisely at 8.2% relative uncertainty, also here dominated by statistical uncertainties and by the lepton identification uncertainties. We also here have already a differential measurement with full, the, the full 13 TV data set available. As you can see here in the lower three plots, this is in a good agreement with the prediction. And for TT gamma, we have a brand new result from CMS in the dilepton channel, which has a relative uncertainty of only 3.8%, which is also dominated by statistical lepton efficiency and luminosity uncertainties. 
And also we have a differential cross-section measurement. And as you can see here, there are some small deviations, but we have largely agreement with the prediction here. Now we've talked a lot about TTBAR aggregated processes. Now I would like to talk a little bit more about single talk. So um, we, uh, we start here with the TZQ process, which has been observed both by Atlas and CMS already. And this is a purely electronic production of the top, where the top quark is strongly polarized, which means we can measure the spin asymmetry. And we can also measure the ratio before top anti-top production. On the left-hand side, you can see the result from Atlas, where we use the neural network as a discriminant variable and see that we have a good agreement with the prediction and the relative uncertainty of this measurement is 15% and dominated by the statistical uncertainty. So here we will gain also a lot when we will look at this at, um, at the next run. And for the CMS experiment, we have a brand new result here uh, where also the agreement is very good with the prediction with a relative uncertainty of only 12%. Also a first differential measurement was done. And you can also see here that this ratio R is in a good agreement with the standard model and also the asymmetry A is uh, also in very good agreement. Now for the top polarization measurement at 13 TB, you know that in QCB the parity is conserved, so in TT bar events we don't expect any polarization. But in a single top production we have the weak interaction with the V minus A vertex structure and we expect a significant polarization here in single top events. And the measurement here is performed in the T channel and uh, of the, in the T channel production, and you can see um, we need first to um, to uh, define our uh, top quark rest frame and define our coordinate system in which we measure this. And what was done is, as you can see in the middle plot, we slice the phase space into eight different parts, the so-called optant variable. And then separately for leptons with negative and positive charge, we look into each of these um, optants and look at the event here, and this is shown in the lower right-hand plot. So we have here one entry per octant, and from a fit to this distribution, we can extract the signal background normalization as well as six polarization values. And this is shown in the upper right-hand table here, and you see that the um, normalization is in good agreement with the, uh, with the standard model expectation, and if we look here at the polarization values, you see that in x direction and in y direction, everything is compatible with zero polarization, as you would expect. But in the z direction, we have very strong polarization, which is also what we would have expected. And if you look at the left-hand plot here, we have our power plus Pythia 8 expectation shown as a red star compared to the measured value with this black cross. And you see this is in good agreement. And this measurement is limited mostly by jet energy resolution uncertainty. Then in addition, we have unfolded angular distributions to also set limit on EFT operators. And one example is shown here in the lower right-hand plot. Um, and also here you see that this is in a good agreement. Now, um, why do we have to find more about the top quark mass? I, measured, I mentioned before that we've measured this to very high precision already. But uh, as you also know, it is very important for standard model extensions. And not only this, because, but it also has an influence on if the Higgs potential is stable or metastable, assuming that we have no new physics up to the Planck scale. So you see here two plots. Let's look at the left hand one before, uh, first. So there we see on the x axis the Higgs pole mass, on the y axis the top pole mass. And you see three different colors. If the color is green, that means that this combination of masses uh, leads to a stable Higgs potential. If it is yellow, that leads to a metastable one. And if it's red, it leads to an instable one. If we now zoom in more to the region where we have performed our measurements, you, this is shown here on the right-hand side, you can see that the measurements are in the metastable region with uh, uncertainty. So if we go two, three sigma away from this measurement, we would still end up in a stable region. So it's directly at the border between metastability and uh, stability. So obviously this we also would like to understand better. So we have to make more precise measurements. The question is what mass do we measure at all? There's a lot of discussion still going on about the definition of the top quark mass. Um, we have direct reconstruction measurements where we measure something that sometimes is called uh, Monte Carlo mass, which depends on the renormalization scheme of the Monte Carlo generator. But the top mass that we could measure, for example, from cross-section measurements is closer to the top pole mass. And the difference between these definitions and other, other mass schemes is still the subject of lively discussion, so I won't go into many details here. But it will just show how much we know so far. So on the left-hand side, you can see the results that we have from the um, 
cross-section measurements, and you can see they are in good agreement, and also the uncertainties have, have reduced strongly during the last few years. On the right-hand side, we can see the results from the direct measurements, and also here the uncertainties uh, were strongly reduced. But I will only focus on one of these measurements today, which was made by CMS very recently in the single top final state. So why is uh, top mass measurement in the single top final state so interesting? It allows to measure the top mass as a lower uh, energy scale as done in TT bar events, and it has different systematics in TT bar events. But at ATV, the overall uncertainty was still very large. The challenge here is that we have large contamination from TT bar and W plus, uh, plus jets events that are difficult to remove. So the idea here is that we train BDT, cut on the BDT output, and therefore get rid of a lot of the background. If you focus on the left-hand plot first, you can see uh, on the x-axis the BDT selection threshold, and on the y-axis you can see the overall uncertainty, and in red the statistical and profiling uncertainty. You can see the red distribution is relatively flat up to a point of 0.8, and then strongly increases. So this was the selection part that was chosen in order um, to make it, to get a purer sample. And if you look at the middle plot, what we get here then is also a much larger signal purity, so we get rid of a lot of the background. And the upper plot shown here is the, before we apply any selection. So you can see T channel in red is relatively small compared to the other processes. And the plot below shows after the selection where we have a strongly signal enriched process. And then profile likelihood was performed to the distribution. And an overall uncertainty below 1 GV was obtained. So this is the first time that we have managed such a, such a precision in a single top final state. And in addition, CMS also measured the um, difference in the mass. And you can see here the mass differences are still compatible with CPT invariance. Now, um, we could also measure the energy asymmetry and boost the TT bar jets events. You probably know that we've measured the charge asymmetry before, but in the rapidity at the LHC, where it appears only uh, at, in TT bar events at next to leading order. Here, we can measure also the energy asymmetry in TT bar plus jets events at tree level. As you can see in the two Feynman diagrams here, these have uh, usually more a quark gluon initial state than a cubic bar production. And this is also very sensitive to EFT for fermion, fermion operators. What we measure here is this asymmetry. So we calculate first the energy of the top minus the energy of the anti-top quark, and then uh, split the phase space uh, depending on the um, an angle of the jet, this additional jet, um, and the positive z-axis. And then measure the asymmetry here. And as you can see on the lower plot, that we have, for example, in the second bin, where we have the highest precision, uh, we measure uh, already we measure in a symmetry, that, but this is in very good agreement with the standard model prediction. Um, and this measurement is still dominated by the statistical uncertainty, so this will benefit strongly from having a larger data set in one three. And also, um, this is an important new variable in the EFT fit. So we've discussed one top and two top production, but actually we can go higher and we can produce four tops, for example, as you can see here. And this, as I said before, is a very rare process. In case of new physics, this cross-section would be although very much larger. So um, this could, for example, be caused by Duino pair production or scalar gluon pair production. And this final state is also sensitive to the topics you cover coupling up to a point. Um, what can we learn about such rare process at all? So the problem is that we have large backgrounds from TG plus heavy flavor production. But um, we can rely heavily on machine learning in order to reconstruct the event and reconstruct also the final discriminant to separate signal and background. And this already gives us a very good handle on this um, very rare process. In CMS, we have an ex expected and observed significance close to three sigma, as you can see in the plot here. In ATLAS, we have a combined observed significance from 4.7 sigma, uh, which constitutes evidence, and the measurement is limited by signal and background modeling uncertainties. Now, we can also use top quarks to search for new physics processes. An example here is a search for CP violation in Lemon Plachet's TD bar events. And as you know, the standard model CP violation of TD bar events is small, which means that the search is very sensitive to beyond standard model physics. And it also allows to constrain from electric dipole moments, as for example, can also be done in spin correlation measurements. And now we can construct observables, which are triple products of momentum vectors. And one observable is shown here on the right hand side. And you see in the middle panel that we have very good agreement with data in Monte Carlo. In the lower panel, you can see how this would uh, look like, how the shape would look like with beyond standard model physics, but there is unfortunately no sign um, on this yet. 
And what's actually measured is this asymmetry value. And we can compare here the result that we have obtained at ATB, which is shown in green, with the result that we have obtained here, which is shown in orange. And you can see that the precision has increased immensely, but there are still no signs for CP violating effects. Now we can search for charge left on flavor violation. Um, as you know, the yeah. left on Excuse me. You have five minutes. Okay, thank you. The left on flavor violation in the uh, flavor conservation in standard model is an accidental global asymmetry, a global symmetry. And um, but we have observed that neutrino flavors are not conserved. So the question is, are the lepton flavors conserved? And many beyond standard model theories predict charge lepton flavor violation, like for example, MSSM or leptoquark models. And we have here a new result from CMS where they use TT bar and single top events. Um, shown are the final diagrams here on the right hand side. And we have separated signal and background here with the boosted decision tree with this BDT output, and this allowed to set limits. And this is shown on the right hand side here, uh, on the left hand side here. So there is no sign for a charge left on flavor violation. As you see, this would appear normally at very high values of this BDT discriminant, but there is um, no room for new physics at this point. But this allowed to set very strong limits. Atlas has made a similar measurement by based on TT bar events, also using a BDT discriminant in the fit to data, which is shown here on the right hand side. And also here, there is no sign here for new physics. Then in addition, so what we want to test is also the lepton flavor universality. Uh, we have uh, discussed before that the Higgs boson couples differently to different fermions and the strongest coupling we have for top. But the question is, how does this work for other boson couplings? In the standard model, the lepton coupling to WZ bosons are not mass dependent, but uh, lepton flavor universality has no fundamental physics reason as mentioned before. So what can we measure now and why? We want to measure the ratio of W bosons decaying into muon and house. Um, this has been done in a previous measurement by lab, where a 2.7 sigma deviation from the standard model was observed, as also discussed by Audric before. And the question is if this is a fluctuation or a new physics effect. Why do we want to do this in TT bar events, though? So as you know, the branching ratio for top to WB is almost 100%. And this is the final state, which is very easy to select, which has large statistics and always gives us two W bosons. So it's a perfect environment for such a measurement. The W decaying directly into a muon and the neutrino uh, has usually a larger lepton PT and a low impact parameter D0, which is close to the interaction vertex. In case the W decays first into a tau and only then into a muon, we have a lower lepton PT and larger D0. So the decay is roughly two millimeters away from the interaction vertex. And now we can fit this impact parameter distribution um, as a measure for the displacement, uh, displacement of the muon vertex. And as you can see in bright green, that prompt muons have a low impact parameter, while muons from tau decays have high values. So we can fit this distribution and then extract um, the ratio. And as you can see here, this is a good agreement with a, a value of one, while it is um, still far away from the value which was measured at lab. Now, uh, last but not least, I want to mention lepton uh, searches for uh, flavor changing neutral currents, which are forbidden at tree level in the standard model when thus are pressed um, in loops by the gym mechanism. But many new physics models allow for flavor changing neutral currents. So there are much larger branching ratio possible in these models, which are reached for the LHC experiments. And in top quark physics, we, uh, this, um, these kind of processes can occur in many production or decay channels. I showed you a few examples. And we have here a summary plot on the right hand side that was made public for the top 2021 um, top 2021 um, conference. But a lot of these measurements are already um, made uh, new results for. So you can see here, in, uh, for example, the upper left plot, we have here a strongly improved limit for THBB production. Uh, in the middle, there is a, a TG um, coupling, so we, then we have an approved limit by a factor of two compared to ATV. And for FCNC measurements in TZQ, we have the most uh, stringent limits to date currently by Atlas. And we, uh, you can see, if we look again at the right-hand plot, that we are reaching now branching ratios that are possible in the standard model scenarios. So all of these analysis will strongly benefit from a larger data set, and they also strongly rely on boosted decision trees and neural networks in order to distinguish between signal and background. Um, more details on FCNC searches will be also shown in Anna's talk tomorrow. So let me come to my summary. 
Um, we can conclude that the top bar has really come a long way since 1977. Back then, it was just a missing quark assumed to be similar to other quarks. But nowadays, we know that the top quark is very special. And we live in a precision era, and the top quark is key to an abundance of different research areas, as I've shown today. If we look to the future, we further have to reduce systematic uncertainties, especially the energy scale and um, signal modeling uncertainties, look at rare processes, which are now finally accessible, and test beyond standard model theories more also in the EFT framework. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for such a comprehensive talk and finishing really on time, on the dot. Uh, are there any questions or comments on this talk? Okay, uh, in case if there are no questions from the participants, I just wanted to ask you, uh, you did not really mention anything about the CKM uh, matrix element measurement from the single top. Would you like to comment on VTB or something like that? Uh, yeah, for VTB, actually, yeah, for, for this, I don't, uh, I don't have the results here. Um, so there we have, yeah, this is only uh, obviously only uh, possible to measure in single top events, and both ATAS and CMS have measured it, uh, measured it to very high precision. But I don't recall the latest results, unfortunately. There are also other processes that could be accessible, like for example, VTS, but for this, we unfortunately don't have measurements yet. Okay, so I see a hand raised by Gregory, please go ahead. Yes, uh, so can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we do. Okay, so thanks a lot for the talk. I just wanted to ask about the uh, the deviation you see between data and Monte Carlo about the boosted top results at the beginning of your talk. Mm -hmm. Whether uh, There's probably a region, an intermediate PT region where you can have both the boosted and non-boosted uh, analysis in a way. And they would be sensitive to different kinds of systematics, both on the data and also in terms of Monte Carlo modeling. Is there a way to gain some information about in, within that region? Uh, yes, we, we have looked at both and also um, basically made combined plots. I, I don't have the one here. So um, the, for TT bar, so for the, for the low PT region, this is often just um, really limited by modeling uncertainties. Um, for the high PT region, uh, we also uh, partly have obviously a problem still with statistics, so we would really gain a lot um, if we have a larger data set. But also the large R jet uncertainties uh, are sometimes a problem depending on the final state. Uh, but uh, I don't recall if we have any particular finding for this transition region. So if we look at this combined plot um, in, in, in exactly in this region, we both see in both cases still this kind of deviation. Okay, well, thanks. Okay, there is a question by Marcel, please. No, I just wanted to follow up on this. Um, right, th there is this consistent slope in, in basically every measurement of top PT uh, or MTT bar or any uh, observable that is closely related to these. Some of it is covered uh, by by next to next leading order corrections. Uh, so some of the, the corrections we know but are not included in, in the Monte Carlos do do tend to reduce that tension a bit. Uh, I think all the measurements that, that we have are, are consistent in showing this trend. Thanks, Marcel. Okay. Any more questions? Well, Andrea, thank you very much again for a wonderful talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Could you please stop sharing? Uh, so next uh, talk is a QCD at high PT, an experimental overview by Very Candelis. Please, uh, it's all yours. We cannot hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, hello. Yeah, sorry. Can you see the slides? 
Yeah, yeah, we do see the slides. Perfect. So thanks a lot for the opportunity of presenting this talk on IPTQCD on behalf of the Atlas and CMS collaboration. So let me start. So um, a brief overview of my talk, I will start talking about phenomenology of IPTQCD at the LHC. And then I will show you some of the most recent and interesting results on IPTQCD from Atlas and CMS. And I decided to divide my talk into three major topics, which are perturbative tests, event topology, and flavor. And then I will conclude with some summary. So let me start with some uh, information about phenomenology of IPTQCD at the LHC. So this is really a difficult task since in uh, IPT, high energy proton collisions, QCD is everywhere at the LHC. Uh, you can see in this slide two event display from Atlas and CMS, uh, which uh, show uh, IPT jets with a PT of 3 TV and 1.9 TV. So why it is important to study QCD at the LHC? Well, first of all, I would say the perturbative regime is one of the main experimental tests that we can uh, uh, do. And of course, IPT QCD means IPT jets, which are the signature of quark, uh, of the pre presence of quark and gluons. And also the associated production of jets, so just basically quarks and glue and associated to uh, vector bosons or Higgs bosons can be a powerful experimental handle to extract information from uh, for the perturbative regime of QCD. Also perturbative QCD is critical to understand the standard model uh, in uh, uh, all is, um, different uh, uh, composition and uh, go beyond it and search for beyond standard model physics. The phenomenology of IPTQCD at the LHC is really vast. I will try to show you one, some of the most important uh, uh, results uh, about it. You can also see the LHC kinematic plane on this slide where the energy of the process is uh, shown as a function of the Birkin X showing the different uh, uh, regions of phase space accessible. So as I said, uh, QCD means jets and the LHC is one of the, it's basically the most efficient jet factory of the world. And as I said, jets are the uh, experimental signature of quark and gluons. So what we can do uh, measuring jets in our experiments? Well, we can do a lot uh, from the point of view of the, let's say pure QCD, we can explore the perturbative regime, regime at IPT and also have uh, information on uh, PDFs that can be constrained. We can probe and measure the strong coupling constant and access to uh, the QCD dynamics of every quark and compare to the predictions and uh, test the perturbative calculation up to next to next to leading order. We can also use experiments, measurements to uh, say more on uh, the Monte Carlo generators and their respective tuning. And from the point of view of, let's say, non-purely QCD, uh, so talking about the standard model in general, we can test it uh, with different final states and uh, uh, try to understand the standard model at very high precision. And also we can go beyond standard model because jets are very often um, signature of uh, uh, possible new physics and resonances particles. The most famous examples are Dijet resonances and monojet uh, topology related to the possible presence of dark matter particles. So, uh, if we uh, put also a vector boson together with a number of jets, uh, we have really uh, the perfect experimental ground field to test the standard model. As you can see from the Drellian. Uh, uh, diagram in this slide, uh, vector boson associated with jets are really sensitive to all the aspects of the standard model. So not only strong interactions, but also electroweak. And so this is really a, a good way, a good experimental way to uh, extract information to test our simulation, improve perturbative calculations and understand 
in general, uh, better the, the QCD modeling. So again, PDF resummation on alpha S and scales can be tested and there's a big phenomenology uh, available that I will try to show you later. An important role uh, is dedicated to the presence of AV flavors because QCD with AV flavors is a, of particular interest because we can test the initial state. Uh, so we can go deep inside the proton and try to have information on the flavor composition uh, and see if there are uh, discrepancies on the PDF of the strange, the beauty and the charm, for example. And we can also test the, um, the theory uh, prediction with heavy flavors. So different flavor schemes introducing uh, the effect of the heavy quark mass can be tested using topologies like W plus C or Z plus B. And I will also show you some results on this particular topic, which is very interesting. So before going uh, to my experimental summary, let me say that IPTQCD means a, a huge collection of experimental results. There's really a lot of amazing publications available. So what comes now is just my, let's say, personal overview of uh, most recent 13 TV results from Atlas and CMS. But if you want to take a look at the full list, then in case I miss something, you can always uh, look at these two links uh, from uh, Atlas and CMS where you can find uh, the full list of publications available on, on standard modeling QCD results. So let me start with inclusive uh, jet differential cross-section at 13 TV from Atlas. So basically this is the measurement of the unfolded inclusive jet and dijet cross-section in beams of uh, rapidity. And uh, theoretical predictions here include the, the NLO jet plus plus using different PDF sets. So this is really interesting to understand uh, the effect of different PDF sets and test it. And also the jet is tested up to uh, 90V. So you can see in this slide, the results of the double differential cross-section as a function of the PTN rapidity of the jet compared to different theoretical predictions. You can see that the agreement is quite good, uh, but there are some tensions, uh, especially in the IPT uh, range. And this is better shown in the next slide where you can see the theory to data ratio plots. It's important to say that this is really high precision since you, uh, you are seeing also the inclusion of uh, uh, next to next to leading order QCD times electroweak correction and non-perturbative effects. And uh, as I said, you have the different uh, PDF sets tested here. So you can see that the data to theory is showing uh, some tension uh, over all jet and rapidity ranges. And, uh, you, you can see it, uh, especially in the bottom right part of uh, the, the PD spectrum. So CMS measured also the inclusive jets uh, spectrum, and this is very a very recent result at 13 TV. Um, so again, inclusive jets cross section is shown in uh, seven rapidity beams and comparisons uh, have been made uh, uh, at next leading order, next to next leading order and next leading order plus next leading log using various PDF sets. Standard uh, jet and pilot corrections here uh, are refined in order to have percent level pre precision. And again, uh, the results of the double differential cross section are shown uh, in uh, these slides. Here, CMS is using two different uh, type of jets, the, so uh, clustering with anti-KT04 and anti-KT07. You can see that the agreement is quite good uh, compared to theory, where we are here testing the CT14 and NLO prediction. Again, here, uh, all prediction include uh, non-perturbative and electroweak corrections. So this is really important and uh, has a strong impact on the measurement of, um, of PDF sets, basically. And in this plot, you can see the ratio plot uh, uh, compared to different uh, theoretical prediction and different uh, uh, PDF sets. As a spin-off of this analysis, uh, uh, you can also uh, see in the publication that the authors made a, a measurement of the alpha S extracted from this uh, analysis. 
and the final result is shown, uh, is shown in this slide. So next slide is uh, about, so now we move to event shape. So this is a very nice analysis from Atlas showing the uh, event shape using multi-jet events. So uh, here dynamics of energy flow in multi-jet is um, presented at IPT. This analysis is really sensitive to IPT QCD. We, uh, we can observe here that seven, six observables are tested in order to discriminate end-to-end -end processes. And again, unfolded differential cross-sections are shown as a function of different observables that are sensitive to the uh, shape of the event. So in this slide, you can see the comparison as a function of the transverse thrust, which is defined as the formula. In the slide, uh, this is a typical observables used to uh, discriminate the uh, event topology. And predictions are uh, shown at next to the link order, also using different uh, showers. So this is sensitive also to mm, different modeling of pattern shower. For example, here you can see Herwig 7 with different uh, angular ordering and, and, dipole, um, and dipole algorithms. Here you can see some disagreement at IPT, which is confirmed also in the calculation of sphericity, which is another event observable. And again, IPT is showing some discrepancy with all predictions. So this is showing that basically we are requiring some dedicated tuning or treatment of the pattern shower to have a better modeling of the event shape at very IPT. CMS measure the azimuthal correlations using Z plus jets events. This is very interesting because different, Z, different ZPT regimes are able to discriminate between the production of a Z boson as a radiation from the, the main diagram or uh, at very IPT, you have basically, you are dominated by uh, correction coming from gluon radiation. So uh, CMS studied different PT uh, of the Z uh, starting from 100 GV to discriminate these two type event topologies. So you can see in the plot the unfolded cross section of Z plus jets compared to the prediction of Matakar 5 AMC at NLO uh, with Z plus one jet or two jets and also the prediction of Geneva plus PT8. You can see that the agreement here is quite good. And uh, of course, you are dominated to the matrix element here. So you see the predictions have show some disagreement at uh, low um, delta phi. So here is the delta phi between the Z and the leading jet. If you want to have details about different predictions, here I am showing you uh, some, some details of the generators that have been used. So MADGRA5 ANC at NLO plus PTA8, which is uh, an excluding order up to, to partons with the FXFX merging. And uh, the predictions that have been tested are also the ones from uh, Monte Carlo at NLO with parton branching set, which is something uh, new for V plus jets. Uh, uh, studies at CMS. Also, Geneva at next to next living order is shown. And again, here you can see the plot of the delta phi between the leading jet and the Z, where the PT of the Z is greater than 100 GV. So in the regime where uh, the gluon radiation is dominating the process. So talking about uh, observable sensitive to the uh, to the event topology, Atlas measured at certain TV, this is really uh, a new result as well, inclusive IPT uh, leading jet of 500 GV. So this is really IPT. And uh, the variable that is used to discriminate between collinear and back-to-back -to -back topology is the delta R between the leading jet and the Z boson. You can see that this variable is able to discriminate the, the two topologies. So basically low delta R means collinear, while uh, delta R going up to four means that you are, uh, you are sensitive to the back-to-back -back configuration. So uh, 
once you have chosen these variables, you can uh, disentangle the two topologies. And here you can see the jet multiplicity for the two uh, kind of uh, diagrams. So collinear and back-to-back -back configurations compared to the prediction at next leading order from Madgraf and Sherpa. And you can see that the agreement here is quite good. And we are testing up to uh, six jets in the final state. Again, here you can see the summary of all the configurations. So inclusive IPT collinear back to back and IST, where is this the sum of the uh, jet energies in the event compared to next leaning order prediction, uh, again, Madgraf and Sherpa. You can see that we have overall very good agreement with predictions. And here, of course, the large QCD scale uncertainties uh, are playing a major role. So. Uh, this is one of the most important systematic uncertainty to, to take care of. Also, Sherpa is including electronic corrections here. So let me now move to flavor. So QCD with flavor, as I was saying at the beginning of my talk, is really interesting because it allows to uh, better understand the flavored structure of the initial state. So the important thing here is that we can uh, uh, this we can test two different kind of uh, theory predictions. The so-called four-flavor scheme, where the big quark mass is included in the perturbative expansion, and the big quark is produced explicitly through gluon splitting in the final state, and the so-called five-flavor scheme, where the big quark is included in the initial state, and the effect of the big quark mass is set to zero in the prediction. And so discriminating between, between these two flavor scheme is important to better understand the QCD dynamics of the bottom. The analysis from CMS is performed using Z boson decay into leptons plus uh, B jets, where the B is stacked using deep neural network based uh, algorithms up to 70% efficiency and a mistake rate of 10% and 1% for light quarks. And uh, here, the strategy is to uh, measure the unfolded differential cross-section for one, more than one B or more, more than two Bs, and exploring the vast phenomenology of Z plus B on different observables. So as an example, I'm showing here some ob observables that are related more on for the, the related to the perturbative QCD uh, information, so ZPT and uh, leading widget PT compared to predictions of Madgraf 5 AMC at NLO uh, in the leading order mode and next leading order mode with an NPDF 3.1 and 3.0 and different uh, tunes. You can see that the agreement uh, is really good in, and uh, you can see that the spectrum are uh, really describing uh, uh, data. And uh, this is um, one of the most important tests we can do for PQCD with the V flavors. A special observable that I wanted to show you here, of course, you have a lot of observables in this paper, but this one is a special one. It's called the ZBB asymmetry, which is related to the angular different distance from uh, the Z boson and the, the B jet. And these observables, uh, uh, is showing you basically that you can disentangle two different topologies. Uh, when this asymmetry observables is approaching zero, the two bijets are symmetrically emitted with respect to the Z, while going up to uh, asymmetry equal to one means emission of additional gluon radiation. So this is another really uh, interesting test of perturbative QCD and test of gluon density. So this asymmetry here is not really described by any predictions. You have this disagreement on basically all prediction. The best performances are basically from Mangraf in the leading order mode. And of course, this needs more attention for future studies. So Z plus B in ATLAS. So ATLAS also measured the Z plus B uh, final state. And uh, here, the main difference between uh, the CMS analysis is on the theory prediction, because ATLAS, for the first time, is showing a new uh, sharp approach where the two flavor schemes are somehow uh, fused together. So this fused approach was tested for the first time here. 
And uh, as you can see uh, from the leading budget uh, PT, uh, all fourth flavor prediction are underestimating the Z plus one B cross section. And this was shown also uh, in the CMS analysis. Also this fuse approach uh, apparently is failing to describe the eye tail of the leading jet PT, as you can see from the plot uh, on the left in these slides and also prediction of Algen plus PTA6 is shown uh, from Atlas. Excuse me, you have uh, five minutes. Yes, thanks. So three observables measured by Atlas related to Z plus B, which are very interesting, are shown in this slide. The first one is the delta phi between the Z boson and the leading B jet, which is sensitive to additional QCD radiation. In the center, you have the delta uh, rapidity between the Z and the B, which is more sensitive to resummation and B core PDF. And on the right part is the delta R between the Z and the B, which is another uh, perturbative QCD related uh, observables, which is really giving us information on the, on the dynamics of the process. You can see that again, uh, this fusion approach is apparently not improving the description of data, which are basically described by the next winning order prediction uh, from Sherpa in the five flavor scheme. And in the ratio plot here, you can see basically that the five flavor uh, scheme on the main plot and the ratio plots includes also prediction from uh, the, the fourth flavor and Alpgen. So a summary plot on the cross sections measured by Atlas is given in these slides where you can see all the different predictions. So Madgraf, Sherpa and Alpgen in different configurations. So leading order, next leading order for flavor and five flavor compared to uh, measured uh, unfolded data. And you can see that in the case of Z plus at least one B, you have many predictions that are uh, a bit off from the uh, experimental value. And uh, the situation is a bit better on the Z plus at least two Bs, where uh, all the predictions are uh, uh, in agreement within one sigma. So to conclude this flavor uh, uh, QCD with Z plus B, we can say that five flavor is uh, either Madgraf or Sherpa uh, giving uh, the be best prediction, while the fourth flavor is always uh, generally underestimating the measured cross sections. So, few words to conclude my talk. So, IPTQCD uh, is a super rich and growing field in uh, at the LHC, and there are lots of new ideas on different uh, topologies and variables to be used, final states, reaching uh, uh, for, uh, for the first time some new open questions and uh, trying to resolve some uh, historical uh, uh, issues that we uh, have seen with data so far. There's an impressive set of results from Atlas and CMS, and I, also, I, I just give you uh, uh, an overview of some highlights, let's say, on uh, jets, V plus jets and DB flavors. Today, there are uh, many efforts ongoing on 13 TV. For example, what is missing in my presentation is QCD with photons, which is really, really interesting. And photons can be uh, measured in association with jets and DB flavors. And we are working on that both in Atlas and CMS. So new results on uh, photon QCD are coming maybe for, uh, for the next Lepton Photon Conference. And uh, new, uh, we can say that a new uh, era of uh, theory prediction uh, is coming. And we have lots of new ideas on the theory side. So not only uh, reaching the highest precision, but also using new approaches like pattern branching, PMDs and merged flavor uh, schemes. And this will uh, definitely expand our knowledge of QCD at IA energy more than ever. So thanks a lot. Thank you <clears throat> for a very good talk. Are there any questions to the speaker? Okay, while you think of a question, I can ask one question to the speaker already. Uh, most of the Monte Carlos you have used uh, for comparing with the data, are they based on pattern shower Monte Carlos or? Yes, basically, all of them are uh, uh, matrix element plus parton shower. 
because you uh, you need pattern shower uh, to describe the jet multiplicity where the matrix element is not uh, uh, well let's say matrix element is always uh, uh, reaching the next leading order precision up to the third jets or um, up maximum let's say so pattern shower is including also the higher multiplicities I see. Are there any questions? So, you are very clear that there are no questions then. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, we can move on to the next talk, uh, which is the, the talk by Gregory uh, Swice on jet physics at theoretical overview. Hi. Uh, well, hi again. Uh, so can anyone see my, oh no, I need to share my screen. If, otherwise that's going nowhere. All right. Can anyone see my screen? Yes, I do. Okay, good. So far, so good. So thanks a lot for the uh, invitation to speak here. Uh, obviously, jets are not directly involving leptons and photons. So I thought since this is a little bit uh, kind of a broad audience, hopefully, and uh, a topic not directly related to uh, to uh, leptons and photons. I'll try to make a quite uh, generic talk. Uh, instead of focusing on on what's very new and brand new, I'll try to give you a broad overview of the concepts and and where they stand uh, today. Hopefully, convincing people that there's interesting physics beyond uh, jets and their substructure. So maybe just to put things in perspective, many of these things have been said and used in the previous talks. So I can I can probably just give you the the, the big picture here. At the end. Of of the day, what you want to do is is study uh, is study the hard processes which happen at the core of the collision in a, in a collider physics, and so that hard process li lives at currently at the let's say a scale which is above 100 GV, so typically one TV at the LHC, more in potential future colliders. But whenever you produce quarks and gluons, or even sometimes uh, electronic bosons in these processes, uh, you don't observe them directly. They tend to branch, uh, and essentially the quarks and gluons branch until they reach, uh, they reach a, a scale of the order of one GV, where they become non-perturbative. Then they hadronize, interact with the rest of the beam, and that's, it's the this whole system which produces the final state that you're seeing. Now, all the bits going from one TV from the hard scale down to a scale of order one GV, that's controlled in perturbative QCD and where, where there's lots of theory progress, while everything which is down to lower scale involves essentially non-perturbative modeling, which, which is probably a bit more model dependent. Now, at the end of the day, one big thing is that the, the processes that describe part on branching, so quark gluon branching, typically happens at small angles. And so that means that the initial heart, so the blue guy, the, the blue quark that was produced here at the beginning, develops a shower, which is essentially collimated, and that becomes what we call now a jet. So the, essentially, the, the, the concept to keep in mind here is that when you see a bunch of collimated partons at the end of the day, or a bunch of collimated hadrons at the end of the day, this is a trace that there was a high energy guy at the beginning. So the, a jet is real proxy to the direct view into what has been produced in the heart system at the beginning. And so because of that, if you think just about the jet as being a, a proxy for heart parton, which carries info about what happens, what happened in the heart collision, that means that JET can have a very broad range of applications. And indeed, if you look at the LHC, for example, they're used in, in at, well, something like two thirds of the analysis, at least. So in practice, uh, what you do is you invent uh, techniques, which are known as JET algorithms, which allow you to go, if you go back to my previous slide, which allow you to go from this list of final state particle and reconstruct the JET from this list of particles. And an interesting way, if you look through something like four decades of, of history here, is that there's typically two big categories uh, you, on how you can define jets. One is think about these as QCD branchings, and so trying to undo the branching until you get back to the, the original quark or gluon. And the other one is to think about jets as, as energy flowing in one direction, in which case you, that, that's the Korn algorithm which have been used at the Tevatron, for example. So lately, there's been quite a lot of effort in trying to calculate these in perturbative QCD, and we've seen that in the previous talk especially, and maybe the two previous talks, uh, going to next to next reading order in perturbative theory, theory, in 
improving the description of the pattern distribution functions and the Monte Carlo generators and, and all kinds of other uh, progresses in, in, in this direction. So what I would like to do in this talk, well, sorry, uh, maybe just a few words. This indeed allows you to cover a range of energy going from, from say, a few tens of GV up to T uh, of GVs up to TVs, and that's even an old plot here, and also a range of cross sections covering many decades here. So what I'd like to do in this talk is essentially now that I'm hopefully convince you that jets are routinely uh, used at the LHC and we've had uh, many examples of that in the previous talks, I'd like to move to something which is in my opinion where, uh, where there's more, uh, I would say, fun and novelties. And this is something that, that we know now as what we call jet substructure. And so I'd like to focus on jet substructure, I essentially try to convince you that it's helpful it's essentially becoming mainstream and that there's lots of fun to have with this with this thing so maybe just to put the uh the topic a bit more in perspective the main idea is instead of looking at a jet as just a simple one monolithic object that points back to one of the the, the hard patterns created in the in a collision you want to look at the at the internal dynamics of jets so look at the whole set of particles that con that, that are constituting a jet and see if there's some interesting dynamics inside the jet instead of using that as a single object and so over something like a decade, this has proven helpful in quite a series of, uh, of topics, ranging from uh, quark tagging, well, boosted object tagging, mitigating pileups, uh, addressing Monte Carlo generators, uh, impacts in studying the quark gluon plasma and heavy ion collisions, uh, studies of precision studies of, uh, of QCD and, and machine learning. And what I'll try to do over the next, uh, the next minutes is essentially give you a few examples and a few concepts uh, of each of these, essentially all of these, uh, all of these uh, different directions. So before I'm afraid I'll need to give you a little bit of a view and I'll, in, well, over a decade, people have devised a long list of, uh, of substructure techniques. Think about it the same way as people over 40 years have, de have devised different jet algorithms from the cones or different cones used at the Tevatron, uh, different jet algorithms at LEP, uh, new ones for the LHC. Uh, there's a long list of ways to reconstruct jets. In the same way, there's a long list of ways to study the jet substructure. And similarly to what happens in, uh, in jet reconstruction, they can be physically thought of as basically having two trends, a list of things, viewing the jet as a list of QCD branchings, like what happens in, in, uh, in jet algorithms, and a list of ways, which are the right-hand ones on this slide, viewing the jet as a flow of energy. And again, that means that conceptually, there's, there's really a, a, a kind of a correlation between what happens at the level of the jet and what happens at the level of the substructure. So it's definitely right of, of, the, of the purpose of this talk to review these all of these techniques. Instead, what I'm going to do is focus on, on one aspect, which is essentially based on the, on the tree of QCD branchings, and use that throughout the talks to, to show how it can be applied in different, uh, in different directions. So obviously, you could probably do the same thing with energy flow polynomials, for example, but I'll, I'll use something different here. Uh, so, the main idea of the talk is focus on a single view of, the, of a jet and use it to show applications in, in several directions. So imagine you have a jet and that's a jet you've reconstructed and studied at the LHC and each of the, uh, the black lines here represents one of the constituents of the jet. One thing you can do is actually use something which is known since, uh, since several tens of years, uh, which is known as the cambridge Aachen algorithm. And that's a fancy name to say that what you're going to do is dress this list of particles with a tree structure, essentially using an, an iterative recombination of the closest pair of particles. So essentially the width of the line here represents the energy, would be typically representing the energy of the particle. So the, the, the first pair, the closest pair is actually these two guys up here. So what I'm going to do is just recombine them. So replace these two guys by a single one here. Then the next closest pair is the two guys at the bottom. So I'm going to recombine in a single object and carry on recombining these two here. Then I guess these two at the bottom, then these two here until you've reached a single object, all right? 
So this means that by this technique, you start with the list of particles and you've been able to dress this list of particles with a tree structure, which hopefully corresponds to uh, collinear branchings in QCD because we know that branchings in QCD follow angular ordering and so go from large angle to small angles. So, for ex so now if you have a tree structure, you can study that. And you can use that to study the jet. Uh, so the idea again being that this, this structure mimics the partnering branchings that had that happened and gave rise right to the jet initially. And for example, one thing you can do is view this hard. If you take if you start with a hard particle and follow the hard particle all the way to the root of the tree, the all these things, all the emissions from that blue lines would typically correspond from the emissions from the leading part on the inside your jet. Uh, so that's that's one simple thing you could do, for example. So with that object, let me start and discussing the application to, to, to tagging boosted objects. So it's again something we've seen in the in the top earlier. I'm going to use the example of the W here. So imagine you study the W at an energy scale, which is smaller or roughly equal to the mass of the W. So if you have a W, I don't know, W plus jet, or whether the energy of the, well, the PT of the W is at most 100 GV, then when the W decays into a QQ bar, each of the QQ bar is going to give you a jet jets and you'll get two jets in your final state and the sum of these two jets would reconstruct your w now as you progressively increase the pt of your uh, of your w the decay angle between the quark and the anti quark is going to progressively shrink and it's it's a simple boost process the the typical decay angle between the the qq bar pair produced from the decay of the w typically goes like the mass of the W divided by PT of the W. And so as PT increases, uh, if you work with a fixed jet radius, say typically 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, as we've seen in the previous talks, you, those two quark and anti-quark are going to start belonging to the same jet. And so instead of seeing a W as two jets, you would see the W as a single jet. And so you probably have to realize that this is a shift in, it is really a conceptual shift. Before we were saying each quark or each quark and the quark gluon give me a jet, and so W decays to two quarks. Hence, uh, I want two jets. A typical W decays in two jets. Now, in this case, the W decays in a single jet, and this means that now you have to be able to separate whether that jet comes from a W compared to the typical jets you would have at high PT, which are jets coming from a quark or a gluon. So this means that now. Uh, a jet is no longer a proxy to just a quark and gluon. The jet can be a proxy to basically any kind of objects uh, which can be ultimately boosted. And again, the idea here, the main conceptual idea is look inside a jet, look at the dynamics inside the jet to be able to tell whether it's a W or a standard quark or gluon jet. And again, uh, maybe this is an example from, uh, from an Atlas event display, where if you look at the jet somewhere here flying in, the, in that uh, bottom right direction of the, uh, of the detector, the question is whether the particles you see here, are they something that was initially a quark fragmenting or a gluon fragmenting or something, or something like more of a heavy object, like a W fragmenting or a tub fragmenting in W doing fully hadronic. And uh, again, for reasons I can't explain here, uh, this is actually a, taken from a boosted top candidate, as was said uh, two talks ago uh, in Atlas. So really the goal here is to, the, the ultimate goal is to properly identify what was produced in the heart process. And again, this is a very generic application. It's relevant for any kind of studies, including for example, new physics searches where you want to see what happened at the beginning of your, at the, at the core of your, uh, of your high energy collisions. So going back to the, the tree picture I presented a few slides ago, there's several things you can do. So again, if, imagine you have a, a W branching, like the one I had here. Typically the W would branch in a QQ bar pair. So you have a high energy W branching in a high energy quark and a high energy anti-quark. So what you would do in the tree of the jet is really looking in that tree for a branching which corresponds to hard W to QQ bar branching. So typically, a, Q, a typical QCD jet would essentially, since the probability to emit a gluon is essentially proportional to one of the energy of the gluon, that's a soft divergence, you predominantly emit soft gluons in QCD, most of these emissions from the hard 
from the leading part of your jet, most of these emissions would actually be soft gluons happening at all kinds of angles. Now, if you look at what happens for a W, you'd expect that at some point, that double, at the point where the W splits into QQ bar, you'd have branching of energy, which is essentially uh, equidistributed between the quark and the antiquark. Why? So that means that you'd have a branch which is harder in a W case than what you'd have in a, in a typical QCD jet. Furthermore, since the W is, is essentially colorless, at large angles, you'd expect much less radiation than what you would have in a typical QCD jet. So essentially, based on this kind of tree picture, you can devise techniques which are able to separate uh, W or Z or Higgs, that would happen also for Z or Higgs boson, decaying to, uh, to QCD, decaying to a boosted jet, compared to the QCD background here. Uh, one aspect, one simple method to do that is look at the hardest branching along these lines and impose that this is above a certain cut. Uh, most of the QCD lines belong to the cut, and so you'd remove background, QCD background and keep a lot of, uh, of your W signal. Uh, and actually, this kind of techniques is what had been used, if you remember from, uh, well, I hope some of you remember the uh, the excess that both Atlas and CMS were seeing in diboson, in boosted diboson uh, decaying to uh, to QCD at the end of run one, that this, at this, say, a 2 TV uh, WW or ZZ or WZ uh, resonance, each of the Ws or Z essentially have one TV, and so identifying them and seeing that bump was relying on, on boosted W techniques. So uh, probably the next kind of interest is, uh, is doing, well, essentially using substructure in order to study QCD. Uh, and essentially that started something like almost 10 years ago when it was realized that actually after applying uh, jet substructure techniques, and in this case, I mean, it's, it's a technique, the technique doesn't really matter. It's something called either the modified mass drop tag or, or self drop for, for those who have heard the name before. Uh, after you, uh, you apply these jet techniques, it is possible to do precision QCD. And in a way, this is essentially the, the jet mass distribution to measure the mass distribution after either just the initial jet in red or applying one of these substructure techniques in green or blue. The left is what comes out of Pythia, the right is what comes out of a QCD calculation. And so basically you see that some of the pictures can be understood from, uh, from a perturbative QCD point of view. And this is something that can be used to study QCD. Uh, there's a side effect here, which is, which is the fact, well, there's, there's another effect, which is if you compare the left-hand side would be a Pythia simulation done at parton level, the right-hand side would be a Pythia simulation done including the whole hadronization and the lying event and the, well, the full simulation. And you see that if you compare these two distributions, you can actually see that non-perturbative effects start to kicking uh, later once you apply these substructure techniques. And so this actually, th those two points combined, so the fact that you have a larger range where you can, you can study QCD with, after applying these substructure techniques, there's a larger range when you can study QCD without being worried about, about non-perturbative effects. So you have, you have truly a better handle on, on perturbative QCD and the fact that these jet substructure techniques can be computed up to high precision in, uh, in perturbative QCD. This means that there's a lot of playground in order to apply, uh, to study QCD, study precision QCD in, uh, in jet substructure observables. Uh, this is, uh, so just one comment for those of you who are QCD aficionados, uh, essentially the fact that you're in a boosted regime means that PT is much larger than mass and so Typically, the kind of calculations you have to do in this context is a re an all-order resummation because you'll have uh, essentially alpha s times logs at any order of the perturbation theory. The typical, yeah, when you when you probe two different scales, you have logs in QCD. That is a standard uh, standard ob observation. So this is not just wishful thinking. It's something that has been measured in. Uh, in practice and compared to the data. So I'm showing here actually quite old measurements, five years ago measurements from both CMS on the left and Atlas on the right, where they compared essentially a measurement of this exactly the jet mass I was talking about before, compared to some uh, analytic calculations here, for example, either to next next leading log match leading order, or to next leading log match the next leading order, both including non perturbative effects. And you see actually a quite, quite a good agreement between the, the data and the theory. 
story. One one potential interest here would be to see whether these kinds of data uh, and theory calculations can be used to measure alpha s. Uh, I've inserted a link here to a more recent uh, CMS measurement, uh, or more recent and more complete CMS measurement uh, can be found in this in this paper, for example. Uh, so another example of what you can do in QCD is, and I'll go back to this this tree picture once again. One thing you can do is each of, for each of these branchings, you can measure an energy fraction or energy the energy the PT of the soft uh, of, of these two branches and the angle between these two the two subjects. Uh, and so this gives you, if you just say again, for example, follow the emissions from the raw patterns, this gives you a list of emissions from the from the uh, from the leading pattern, which you can just put into dimensional plane, where you measure on the x-axis the log of the, uh, the angle between the two branches, and on the vertical axis, essentially, the, uh, the, re the, the relative uh, energy of the emission compared to the uh, the, the guy that the, the leading part on. Uh, so this is essentially just what happened for one jet. But once you average this over a sample of jets, what you really see is a pattern of how the emissions is distributed within the jet. And a typical thing you can see here is that there's an increase when you go from top to bottom. And that increase is actually directly related to the, uh, the running of alpha, or is primarily dominated to the increase, uh, the increase of alpha s. And again, these kind of things can be computed in perturbative QCD can be measured in the data. So this is a, a measurement by Atlas uh, of exactly this density in the, the left-hand panel. And the right-hand panels compared this, uh, compares this, this measurement with the calculation in QCD, again, showing, uh, showing a good agreement. Uh, Excuse me, you have five minutes. That's perfect, thanks. Uh, so the next thing is heavy-end collisions. There's not much heavy-end collisions in this conference, so I'll just be brief here and highlight the, uh, the essentially the strategy. The idea is again, if if you embed that tree structure inside uh, inside the quark gluon plasma, this jet propagating through the quark gluon plasma is going to be affected. It's going to scatter off the quark the quark gluon plasma, and and again because of these scatterings depicted by these these little blobs here, that's going to modify the way that the jet is going to be that's going to modify the properties of the jet. And so by studying the properties of the jet using substructure, you try to, in, to invert and study uh, how these interactions work or reverse engineer how these interactions work. And, and again, this is something that has that can be measured experimentally. These are two examples measuring essentially energy fractions in the branchings and angular distributions at the branchings. And these can be compared to lists of these measurements can be compared to lists of calculations uh, in, uh, in, in theory. Uh, and there's, there's actually lots of, of of other data. This is a very, I think, I would consider this as a hot topic in uh, in, in heavy integration so far. So. Th the one but last thing I like to discuss is Monte Carlo generators. We've seen Monte Carlo generators being used everywhere. The, everything essentially in in the collider environments is compared to Monte Carlo generators. Uh, and again, the idea here is that jet substructure allows you to probe the dynamics of QCD and Monte Carlo generators just simulate that dynamics. So obviously there has to be a, a, a use for substructure, uh, well, a use of jet substructure in order to improve Monte Carlo generators and or constrain Monte Carlo generators. And I'll give you a series of small examples. The first one is just a direct comparison as we've seen uh, probably a hundred times already today, we just measure something experimentally and you compare that experimental measurements with simulations from different Monte Carlo generators. And in this case is again, coming back to this, uh, this two dimensional plane measurement where depending on how you slice the plane, you can see that different Monte Carlo generators measure properly different region of the phase space. And since this different region of the phase space can be traced back to different aspects of the dynamics, you can show, for example, that in some regions, you actually the parton shower does a better job. In different regions, non perturbative uh, corrections do a better job for this or that Monte Carlo. So this is directly helpful to understand better how the, the your different Monte Carlo generators generate the dynamics. Uh, you can actually go one step further and try to use these uh, these substructure techniques in order to directly assess 
the accuracy of your Monte Carlo generators. For example, in this case, the test checking whether a Monte Carlo generator do agree with uh, with next to leading log expectations from the analysis from the analytics uh, uh, QCD resumation, and you see the typical Monte Carlo generators and this observable uh, like Pythia or Dyer fail to reproduce the expectation, which would be flat. And in that case, we started a, a whole program trying to improve on this uh, on this accuracy and we introduce a set of new showers trying to, which now have this this accuracy uh, you can even go one step further and uh, and design observables which can be then hopefully measured and and show new things uh, for example this is a measurement this is a prediction of some new observable again built on their substructure which shows some uh, some dependence on spin correlations within the jet for which there's absolutely no analytic treatment so far but once you have a pardon shower which has that accuracy you can decide that this is where you can this is actually becoming a, a new prediction that can be then hopefully tested at a collider so again beyond the pure qcd interest the logic is very simple. Monte Carlos are used everywhere. So if you manage to get better Monte Carlos, you get less modeling uncertainties and you get improved uh, treatments of everything, in particular improved searches. And again, the logic being that jet substructure can help you get better Monte Carlo generators. So the last point I'd like to touch upon in just uh, the one minute I have left is, uh, is the case of machine learning. So Deep learning is now almost everywhere in high energy physics, and I think uh, jet substructure was among the uh, among the the few uh, the few pioneering pioneering uh, fields in which uh, deep learning has been used uh, at least in a broad context uh, at least more than five years ago, uh, and it's really a, a, there's really a typical example where you, the, the boosted jet tagging case is really a, a very stereotypical example. You want essentially to discriminate a signal like W, as I was saying earlier, top quarks uh, versus a background. You want to discriminate the signal from a background. So typically W versus QCD or B tagging. You want to separate a B jet from a light jet, a quark jet from a gluon jet. And so this is really separating a quark from a dog. This is a quark images from dog images. This is really the typical application of, uh, of deep learning. And if you see that the plot on the right shows on the horizontal axis, your efficiency of record recognizing W jets from the signal. And on the vertical axis, how the, the rejection factor for the background, so for QCD jets in this case. And you see that based on, so this MMDT you've recognized hopefully from what I've shown before, that would be a simple uh, example that was used, say, based on analytic techniques. And you see that compared to these basic techniques, deep learning has allowed you to gain orders of magnitude in, uh, in, in efficiency. Uh, I'll show you a second example, which is quark gluon tagging, which is more recent. That's something we did uh, essentially last month, where essentially, again, the horizontal axis is trying to set to isolate quark jets from gluon jets. And so again, you see how much we do, how good we do in terms of quark versus the rejection, the ability to reject gluons. And you see that one, you can, you can be intelligent and do better analytics and that gives you something. Uh, so 40% increase at efficiency of 0.4. And then if you do uh, deep learning on top of that, you get another 50% another gain. So again, that, this plot shows you that both you can do good in terms of understanding QCD analytically, which was in the, in, in the blue bit, and uh, deep learning gets you something else on top of it. Uh, obviously, there's a huge list of studies. This is just really the tip of the iceberg. You can applicate those applications beyond boosted taggings, uh, tons of applications. Uh, you can play with different inputs. You can play with different uh, neural network architectures. Uh, something I like to just draw the attention on is that there's recently some attempts to understand what goes on in in deep learning so what goes on in the in the box inside the network uh, trying to get some handles on what exactly does the network learns and so this means assessing uncertainties uh, hints of infrared colonial safety where you need to understand exactly what the network has learned or really analytically gain some insight on what happens in the chat and uh, in the in the in the in the network and this is such an example where it's exactly the same as this quark gluon uh, simulation here except that instead of using pythia we've used a, a, a toy monte carlo in which we know 
that the analytic calculation gives you exactly the likelihood. And so, and we know that in that case, the deep learning method is supposed to give you the likelihood. And indeed, if you look in the bottom panel, to, if you compare, for example, the red curve and the black curve, at the end of the day, what comes out of the network is exactly the same as what comes out of the analytics, giving you some hints that the network is doing the right thing. So. This is essentially my, my conclusion slide. I hope I've convinced you that uh, jets are everywhere. I think that was even before LEP, and that's going to carry on after the LHC for future colliders in particular. Uh, and now I think substructuring is becoming something mainstream and is here to stay. Uh, at the same time, it gives you a window and searches for new physics through boosted jet tagging and deep learning techniques, for example, uh, through Monte improvements in Monte Carlo techniques as well. And it's also a useful tool to learn about QCD, uh, first of all, in terms of precision calculations and also in terms of developing better partner showers, for example. And it has a wide range of applications, including, uh, including, for example, studying jets in the quark-gluon plasma and heavy ion collisions. Uh, maybe looking more towards the future, uh, jet substructure, I mean, it's easier to study a jet than a full event. So jet substructure can be viewed as a playground for new ideas. Uh, and so you should expect as well more analysis with boosted jet. This becomes mainstream. Uh, my hope would be that there's more unfolded substructure measurements Sorry for the typo here, so that you can uh, you can actually use that in order to uh, to to better QCD. Uh, obviously, deep, deep learning is there as a as a major application. And if you want more, I've added a link to some lecture notes and to the the talks at the Boost conference from the past two years, which would essentially give you a snapshot of what's uh, what's been done recently in the field. So thanks a lot for the uh, for the attention, and I welcome questions. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, no. Any comments? Yeah. Please, uh, Aldrich, go ahead. Hi, Gregory. <clears throat> thanks for the excellent talk. Hi, Alda. Thanks. I just want to pick up on your uh, looking towards the future. So uh, what do you think is, uh, that, and it's personal probably opinion, what is the most thing that you are missing in understanding the sub substructure um, uh, stuff, substructure measurement? What, what do you think we should act as experimenters go and measure with highest priority? Uh, in terms of measurements, I'm actually not, not quite sure I have, uh, well, I mean, th there's obvious candidates, right? There are things like the ones I've, uh, I've highlighted in terms of measuring groom densities, for example, or measuring uh, more, more exclusive observables. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be helpful in terms of uh, understanding, well, assessing either improving Monte Carlos or improving, there's been lots of, of precision calculations done recently and there will be more. And I think things towards measuring alpha S, for example, there's, there's interesting stuff to be done in that direction. But also I think in terms of Monte Carlos, I think that what, I'm, what I would rather stay focused on is probably the fact that uh, there's lots of jet substructure things you can do. And my personal view on this is if you have a problem this yeah it's probably like you know like the uh, some um, some old advertisements from for for uh, well known computer companies uh, a well known computer company if you if you want something there's a, there's a subtractor tool for it uh, and so i think in a way it would be interesting to see sometimes uh, dedicated subtractor techniques for dedicated things uh, and I'm sure, for example, there's room of imp for improvement in developing better techniques targeted, for example, for alpha S measurements, different techniques targeting uh, the studying of the quark-gluon plasma, different techniques uh, targeting the boosted object taggings. And at the moment, there's some techniques which have been used all across. And I think there's room for improvement in that case. And, and in that direction, I think it's really a question whether that can be done one theoretically with a high accuracy and to experimentally with something that you can then uh, uh, get under control uh, detector wise, for example, and, and fall at the end of the day. Okay. Thanks a lot. Sure. 
Uh, any more questions? So, uh, Gregory, thank you very much again. Um, for You're welcome. Time. Thanks. Uh, Marco, you have to say something or we end here? No, I think that's that's it. Thanks very much again uh, uh, to you uh, for chairing the session and to the speakers. And we'll continue at two o'clock UK time with flavor physics. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye.